It's my pleasure also today to introduce you to our next speaker, Mariam Vesade. Mariam is a lawyer, diversity and inclusion consultant, author and social commentator. A fearless advocate, Mariam has for the past decade championed the rights of minority groups in an endeavour to normalise difference, or as she sees it, normality. And I hope we all see it that way in this room at least and help spread it beyond this room. Mariam has a long list of accolades to her name, including Westpac's Woman of Influence Award 2015, Fairfax Daily Life Woman of the Year Award 2016, and Role Model of the Year and Woman of the Year at the Australian Muslim Achievement Awards in 2015. And we're very privileged to hear from her today. So please welcome Mariam. Good morning, all. The privilege is all mine, I assure you. Um, Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I think any discussion around privilege has to be centering the Indigenous population front and centre. And that was so beautifully articulated earlier as well. Now, I'm from Sydney um, and uh, I always enjoy travelling to Melbourne for the day. It feels like a bit of a second home and it's not least of which um, that I'm less likely to be racially profiled at the airport. Um, I did, <laughs> I was uh, privy to another, apologies that's not showing up properly, but at least you don't get to see my face live, um, which is always very awkward. Um, <laughs> What I want to speak to you about today, no doubt, I know that you've had a jam-packed day, um, both today and yesterday, of incredible speakers, um, really hopefully getting you to ponder on, on so many different issues, most of which are particularly relevant um, following the weekend that we've just had. Um, what I want to do is get us to reflect on today on our own levels of privilege. We often speak about privilege or maybe it's something that we don't speak enough about. But what I'm hoping to do is to do some internal reflection today about our own levels of privilege. And perhaps uh, then it's a conversation that we can have much more broadly around privilege. And off the back of, um, of you know, a fairly full-on election campaign, I would dare suggest that it is many of us need to reflect on our privileges and what that means. Um, for me, um, Throughout my career, you know, someone asked me earlier whether I like to talk. Anyone who knows me knows that I love to talk. Um, I am a self-declared chatterbox and um, having spent a decade as a lawyer, it, this was definitely a skill that really came in handy. I was always conscious of building rapport with my clients um, and I remember one specific example where I'd built amazing rapport with an interstate client on the phone. And, you know, we got on like a house on fire, um, you know, often with, I'd, I was a lead legal advisor on her matter, and often, you know, the, the point is that we contact each other to speak about the matter at hand, but we would be sitting there having conversations about what we did on the weekend and kids and what have you. And so I remember having built a lot of rapport, and then I finally got to meet this client face to face. And I remember... Uh, many years ago now, but I remember walking into that room and saying hello and being quite excited to finally meet this person face to face. And, you know, given the months of discussion that we had. And after I said hello, she kind of gave me this odd look. And she said, oh, you must work for Mariam. And, um, and I thought, what, what does she mean? And I thought, okay, maybe she's perhaps confused me with, say, a legal secretary or an assistant. And of course, not that there's anything wrong with me having those roles, but it seems that the voice that she's heard on the phone for all those months didn't seem to correspond with this person that's presented in front of her that day. And so I kind of uh, was a bit dumbfounded at first, and it kind of killed my confidence, and I said, at that point, bizarrely, I sounded unconvincingly, um, quite unconvincing, that I was like, no, 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 I, I am Mariam. <laughs> and then my confidence just, just slowly died away. And it felt like those months of rapport building was kind of, you know, um, just <coughs> went away at that point. And someone who, you know, prides myself on building rapport, I felt that confidence die and a part of me die, 
because that experience is something uh, that I have, one, shared with many people, but it's also not uncommon. I've had many other experiences and I know from speaking to people that they have too, in their own ways, in our own uh, unique uh, situations, whether it's in a professional setting, educational setting, we've experienced things like that. We've experienced being stereotyped. And today, this is part of the reason that I think reflecting on privilege is so vitally important. And specifically on stereotyping, unconscious bias, which I'll go into a little bit further, and how that actually works in such a way that creates an un, unequal playing field. Um, and really to take us to the sort of dictionary definition of what privilege is, it's basically unearned advantage. It's belonging to a club that you didn't really sign up for. You just got membership by default, by virtue of something you can't really control. So it's access or enjoying rights or advantages because you're part of a particular identity. And the thing about it is, as I said, it's acquired by default. It's something that's granted. And hence why it's mostly invisible to those who have it, as so beautifully articulated by Professor Michael Kimmel. And as I always say, because people say to me, particularly on Twitter, where we have wonderfully inclusive conversations all the time, I'm always reminded that I am privileged. And so, hey, I'm not shying away from it. I put up my hand and I say, I am privileged. And the thing about privilege is that it's relative. And it's ultimately subjective. And of course, those with the most amounts of privilege won't even be conscious of it most of the time, and hence why it's invisible to those. Now, dare I say it, I think a key message from this election was that not many of us want to give up our privileges. Not even if it helps secure a brighter future for our children and future generations. I think we fear change. We fear reform and perhaps we fear equality. After all, as they say, equality feels like oppression for those who are so damn used to privilege. I work as a director of the, at the Diversity Council of Australia, a wonderful organisation. If you're interested to know um, more, please come and see me. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about these concepts. How is society formed in terms of how our uh, opinions, um, our perceptions and our stereotypes, how are they created? Think about it. Whose faces do you see on your TV screens? Who holds the key positions in the top ranks of society. And I probably need to tweak this after the election, given some mostly women are now out of that picture. Except for the very few here or there, notice the general lack of, say, let's focus on cultural diversity for now. In today's business lexicon, diversity has become shorthand for groups that are not part of the existing workplace norm. So really, the, the norm mostly is what I call MAX, as in M-A-C-S, male, Anglo, cisgender and straight. That's the norm. Now, what we're exposed to every day feeds the assumptions that we make about people, hence putting up these photos. We tend to all possess a very strong tendency towards people who physically resemble ourselves, and that concept is called affinity bias. Now, experiments have shown us that the brain actually categorises by race in less than 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds. I don't even know how long that is, but it's short. <laughs> hiring decisions. So when it comes to recruitment, hiring decisions are made within the first 10 seconds of a job interview. Now, you're thinking, how does that work? You walk in and the people that are recruiting have unconsciously already made up their mind about whether you're going to be hired or not. They spend the rest of the time, whether it's 60 minutes, 45 minutes, however long, deciding, basically reaffirming to themselves as to why their decision is correct. In the case of wanting to hire someone, they'll be like, yes, 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 that's why, that's why. And in the case of unconsciously already declining that person as a candidate and not putting them forward, they're subconsciously thinking, yeah, no, not right for the role in their mind. 
According to Nobel Peace Prize uh, recipient neuroscientist Eric Kandel, he argues that most of these biases and implicit associations that the brain makes is actually unconscious. So we're not sitting here or sitting there consciously deciding that we're going to discriminate against someone. And implicit associations aren't in their very nature always bad. They're basically shortcuts that the brain makes. So when you're driving, the first time you drive, you put a lot of conscious effort into it. You read the rules, you, you, know, you actually pay attention to the signs, you use your indicator, and you put a lot of conscious effort into it, right? And then after a while, it becomes unconscious. You get in, turn the car on, and you drive. You could almost do it with your eyes closed, although I don't recommend that. But it becomes unconscious. So this shortcut, this association that your brain makes is not entirely bad. Where unconscious associations and implicit associations become problematic is when it comes to prejudice, as an example. When you've learnt it from the outset incorrectly. So you've learnt a bunch of stereotypes, a bunch of assumptions incorrectly from the outset and it becomes almost impossible, a really difficult task to then change that later. Inherent societal privilege means that some of us are given a head start in what I like to call the race of life. And it's actually because of that head start. That head start that comes about because of privilege, not just because we worked extra, extra hard. That there'll always be miles ahead, even if all the participants are running at the same speed, the same distance, and with the same ability. So that's code for the same amount of merit. And as you can see here, it's well documented that women from minority groups face even greater hurdles, quite literally in this diagram. They face barriers to full equality, not just by virtue of their gender, but because of their race, age, ethnicity, disability, religion, or sexuality. They basically face what I call the double whammy. And that concept generally is known as intersectionality. Now, as an Australian woman, who's originally from <laughs> Afghanistan and a Muslim, I get the triple whammy. Very privileged in that regard. I get sexism, I get racism, and I get Islamophobia. I've said this before. A lot of people, you know, boast about having a fan base. And I, as I discovered over the years, I have what I call a troll base. A dedicated group of people committed to the cause of trolling me. And they're so intelligent that they manage to make all their insults intersectional. When we talk about merit, something that is brought up quite often when I talk to people about privilege, and they say to me, but you know, all merit should be, you know, all appointments have to be on merit. Even those from diverse backgrounds keep saying this as if somehow they lack it themselves. And I say, yes, of course, all appointments should be on merit. But there's this assumption being made every single time that the current status quo is somehow based entirely on merit. And it's not. It is not entirely based on merit. In fact, things happen all the time. How did we end up with our current Prime Minister? <laughs> Those mounting this whole merit argument and then, you know, taking that further and talking about positive discrimination, they want to ensure, they would hope that they actually got their jobs entirely on merit. But what if we reversed that argument and we, we challenged it a little bit? What if it was argued that it was because the system favoured them historically? It was because society favoured them because of their identity. Not discriminated against them, but favoured them because of, let's say, max, male, Anglo, cisgender and straight. Now, I recall a conversation that I was having with two senior managers about corporate Australia's shift to start focusing on cultural diversity within their leadership ranks. Of course, there was great more to do around gender diversity, but I remember specifically my role within that organisation was to look at cultural diversity and how we can formulate a strategy to do better in that space. And I remember 
speaking to these two. As I said, one of them was my former colleague. And she was of an Asian Australian heritage. And the man that was standing with her was her colleague, a man of Anglo-Celtic origin. And it's in the context of me telling them about, you know, what my role now entailed, looking at cultural diversity and potentially moving into cultural diversity targets, similar to what we've done with gender diversity, in which he turns to her and says, there you go, another leg up for people like you. I was mortified. Now, she was a colleague of his, so she just, you know, and he said it in a joking manner, and that's often how these um, discussions are had. There's a bit of a smirk and a bit of a joke, and it's all light-hearted, supposedly. So she says nothing. But I could stay silent. I literally remember putting my hand out like this, and I thought, I am not letting this one go. And I remember I turned to him and I said, when you extend a hand to a group of people who for far too long have been effectively walking in the gutter, while others so comfortably stroll the streets, that ain't no leg up. That is not a handout. All that's doing is levelling that damn playing field. I won't tell you what he said. <laughs> Trying to achieve equality, as I said, will inevitably feel like oppression to those who are used to that privilege. And I'm not here to get it all in your face and, and to um, offend people. But these are some inconvenient truths that we as a country need to face. And I feel like as part of the election campaign and in, in the immediate aftermath of that, there's a real lack of understanding as to how privilege operates. Somehow there's this assumption that it's all a pie and we all deserve an equal share of that damn pie. Not acknowledging that some of us already have our tummies quite full while others haven't had any pie at all. I just made that up on the spot. I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> I'm hoping you get what I mean. So it does, I think, we do have this myth around meritocracy. We do have this myth around privilege and we have a myth around entitlement. When we talk about cultural diversity specifically and we talk about discrimination and racism, I want to just quickly talk to you about some research. Studies have shown us that to simply attain the same number of interviews as a person with an Anglo-sounding name, candidates from Indigenous, Middle Eastern and Chinese backgrounds actually have to submit a ridiculous amount of more applications. So people say, well, if you have a go, you get a go, right? Someone says that, I'm not sure who. But studies have shown us but that's not always the case. These candidates were having a go. But when compared to Lisa and Andrew, candidates named Betty and Jimmy had to submit 35% more applications. Candidates named Nadine and Hassan had to submit 64% more applications. And candidates named Ming and Hong had to submit 68% more applications. So what I'm talking about here is submitting applications to get the one callback as compared to an Andrew. So we're talking about getting a callback. We're talking about resumes that were sent out as part of a study that were identical. So nobody could say, well, this one had more merit. This one went to high school here. This one played golf over here. No, all of the resumes were identical. And what they found as part of this study was the callback rate depended on your name. Such an integral part of your identity. It depended on your name. Reflecting on my own career and some of the, well, <coughs> downright jokes that I've had to make to make recruiters feel comfortable when they first meet me, to make them feel at ease, to make them remember, yeah, that, that, you know, the woman I spoke to on the phone who sounded really funny and articulate and great and I think she'd be a great fit, yeah, no, this person standing in front of me is still that person and they're the same. And I remember having to try so much harder 
to make them feel at ease. So they would get over that initial hurdle and, and hopefully put me forward to the next round. And I acknowledge that I've been very blessed and privileged in, throughout my career. But I now have an opportunity to voice my experiences and the experiences of countless others who face this still today. And they don't have the privilege that I have to sit here, to stand in front of you and talk about these experiences. I remember as a junior lawyer, I had some really bizarre comments made to me. And when you're new in any profession and you're a graduate, you know, you're trying so hard to fit in. I remember starting in one particular role as a junior, junior lawyer and a senior, senior lawyer at a uh, lunch gathering decided to make conversation with me. And it was going well until he said, oh, so you're from Afghanistan. All right, so do you know the Taliban? I'm not joking, this was a real conversation. And the thing is, he didn't laugh or say it was a joke or try to smirk. He was dead serious. And I was mortified and I did not have the confidence that I have today to give you my nice boot up the backside. <laughs> not literally. I was mortified. And it's experiences like that that stay with you. And that's not to say that I haven't had positive interactions. But sadly, those things do popped, you know, come front of mind when you think about reflecting on your experiences. I've had other experiences when I've walked into a mediation and I was in a room um, with the client and the barrister for the other side rocked up, you know, rocked up quite late, opens the door, looks straight at me and says, are we in the right place? Now, again, that could mean nothing. But to me, having experienced what I've experienced, it hurt. And again, it killed that confidence that I had. Now, let's look at broader society. Australian Human Rights Commission con conducted a study around the cultural diversity, the cultural diversity of the top ranks of society. But if you can look at the lack of colour on that page, that's the key takeaway. The key takeaway is that, again, at the time that this study was done, looking at ASX 200 CEOs, looking at federal ministry, this was back then, no doubt it'll probably get worse now. Looking at university vice chancellors, the cultural diversity was limited to the green and the red. And the definitions around Anglo-Celtic meant that they, I suppose, distribute it in such a way that European was also in the grey. But if we focus specifically on the red and green, you can see the clear lack of diversity at, at the top level of society. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. But that's assuming that it is based on a meritocracy. And I don't bloody think it is. I don't think a meritocracy exists in the form that we like to think it does. And as I've said, culturally diverse women like me, there's that glass ceiling that is talked about for women. It's double glazed when it comes to culturally diverse women. Hence why I've got heels like this. <laughs> because we have to smash it. And we've got to work together to smash that damn ceiling. Only a tiny percentage of women culturally diverse women are actually ASX directors. I couldn't do this chart with CEOs because there would be nothing to, to put in red because the numbers are so tiny. So think about the cultural diversity of HSC graduates. What message does this actually send to them? How does it help with their aspirations? We know that minority groups spend something like 20 to 30% of their time worrying about how to fit in. They consciously cover their identities in order to be considered normal, whatever the hell that means. Reflecting again on my own career, I've spent a lot of time trying to make conversation and trying to pick up parts of my identity that I can talk about to say in those social gather gatherings, hey, I'm normal. So I'd specifically talk about some things and then avoid talking about other things. And I'm sure there are people in this room that can relate in that regard about 
trying so hard to fit in. Now imagine if people like me, people like you, didn't have to waste 20 to 30% of their time trying to figure out how to fit in. Imagine what that would do for the productivity of organisations, the productivity of this country. Imagine what it would do for people like me. Maybe I'd have more time working towards becoming a bloody CEO. There'll be those of you who are sold on the moral case for why change is required to level that playing field that we talked about. And I think most of you in this room probably fit into that category. We believe in the moral reasons for why you've got to create that equality. But there will always be people who only reflect on the numbers. They'll reflect on the business case or reflect on the dollar figures. And this is why I often talk about this research. Gender diverse companies are proven through McKinsey research to be 15% more likely to outperform the in their industry average. And you add cultural diversity to that mix, they're 35% more likely to outperform their industry average. So as I keep saying, cultural diversity, diversity of all dimensions, ensuring that you create equitable opportunities actually helps your bottom line. It brings about that competitive advantage. And again, we're not talking about tokenistic diversity. I'm not saying you've got to sprinkle some, you know, sprinkle of women and a dab of colour here or there on your websites, on your marketing material and tick this box. Real, authentic diversity brings about diversity of thought, which brings about innovation. And of course, the inevitable flow-on effect is that you'll be reflecting your customer base and better, better meeting the needs of a multicultural Australia. So when we talk about privilege, I'm going to ask you to now reflect on your own levels of privilege. And with that, I'm hoping that you can all participate in this next exercise. If you could please stand up, and if you can't stand, please raise one hand. What I'm going to do is run you through a series of questions. If the answer to the question is yes, I want you to keep standing. If the answer to the question is no, I want you to take your seat and the rest of the questions will be directed at those that are continuing to stand. And the idea is that you need to be honest. Okay, the first question is, did you have a job during high school? If yes, keep standing. If no, I want you to take a seat. Babysitting jobs count. <laughs> Question two, have you been discriminated against, vilified or abused because of something you cannot change about yourself at any point during your career? Okay, so, okay, so we're starting to see some people stand, but it's alarming how many people still, um, sorry, standing. Question three, at some point in your life, have you felt like you've been one of the few or the only persons of your gender, race, faith, sexual orientation or disability in a room in an educational or professional setting. Okay, so we're starting to see people sit. Question four, final question. Have you attended a public school for the majority of your education? Now, without making anyone feel uncomfortable, let's take a look around the room. If I answered those questions, I would be standing at this point in time in this exercise. What I wanted us to do as part of this exercise was really to reflect on our own levels of privilege, but also to see who sat down at which point and who's still standing and how their life experiences may be very different to ours. Thank you very much for being brave enough to participate and please take a seat. How did that feel? Did some of you perhaps cover parts of your identity when we were asking those questions and perhaps you didn't answer them truthfully? Did you feel comfortable enough to respond to all of that? And it's fine if you didn't.
while we're reflecting on this, I want you to think of a person that falls into a sort of a category of, of people that we've been talking about. It could be your own child, it could be your neighbour or just someone that you know and love. Someone who belongs to a diversity, um, one of the diversity categories we talked about. Now I want you to picture them as you think about this and it could be yourself that you're reflecting on. Could you sit back and do nothing knowing that that person that you care about so much could face such odds simply for being who they are? That they could face that kind of discrimination? That they could face those kind of hurdles? That they could be trying to have a go and yet have the door closed in their face? And if you knew that person and you cared about that person on an individual level, you would fight tooth and nail to make sure those hurdles are no longer in the way. You would make sure that you would do anything within your capacity to level that damn playing field. There's never been a more important time for us to actually reflect on our own privileges, to become conscious of our unconscious biases. When we're driving, we know that we've got a blind spot back here. We know that it exists, but we can't see it immediately. But we do every single time make a concerted effort to turn our head, to look and to adjust. It's not good enough to know that we're privileged and to know that we have these biases and these implicit associations. We've got to do something about it. We're living in an era where divisive politics has successfully otherized diverse minority groups. Let's just reflect on the election campaign that we've just had and some of the headlines that we've read and how many diverse minority groups were thrown under the bus for the sake of political gain. We're constantly reading these derogatory headlines and as I said, most of these comments are made by elected officials. When you excuse bigotry in words, you lay the framework to give bigotry in action a free pass. We know that we have an urgent issue of disenfranchisement among the youth, particularly those of diverse backgrounds. You know, we want them to constantly reach for the stars. But you can't aspire to be someone that you can't see. You simply can't. And we have to acknowledge that there is a difference between equality and equity. And this articulates it so beautifully. We need to acknowledge the institutional social barriers that exist and that there is a difference between these two. And that's why additional measures are required, not to give some people an advantage above others, not to give them a handout or a leg up, but to ensure that there is a level playing field. That to ensure that despite knowing that they're running as fast as they, they possibly can, acknowledging that they won't always catch up. And if the moral case hasn't convinced you, reflect back on the business case that we talked about. The thing is, you can't address inequality equally. You can't address inequality equally. And this is why I think we need targets when it comes to various diversity streams. <coughs> and they say, well, why do we need targets? Why? Because the definition of insanity is doing the same damn thing over and over again and expecting things to change. The existing status quo hasn't actually created the meritocracy that we'd hoped for. So we need a bit of a nudge because what, let's face it, what gets measured ultimately will get done and that's what we need. Thank you very much for your time.